Thanks so much, Heather. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the privilege of your time. And to maximize your time, we'll get right into it. So today's uh, session will focus uh, on the middle part of the three-thirds of firearms investigation, extracting and analyzing information from firearms and um, related evidence. Every crime gun holds a story, and part of that story lies on the inside. It's the unique marks that are transferred to fired ammunition components, bullets, and cartridge cases during the discharge process. On the uh, outside of the gun, there's additional information of great value. Make, model, and serial numbers so important for crime gun tracing. DNA, fingerprints, trace evidence, biomaterials, hairs, fibers, blood, an improper grip on the slide of an auto-loading pistol could wind up with that slide coming back and giving you what we call a slide bite, cutting the top of your hand or your, near your finger, near your thumb, leaving blood on the slide. So again, there's a wealth of information from in and outside of every crime gun and related evidence. Unless you have processes in place and people and technology to manage the inside plus the outside information, you'll never get the whole story. And that leads me uh, to what I call the um, inside-out approach to solving gun crimes. And it's simply a presumption that there's an abundance of data inside and outside of every crime gun. And when we're able to fully exploit that data, it can be used to generate actionable information of both tactical and strategic crime-solving value. The inside data, the ballistics data, answers the question, what? What crimes has this gun been used in? And the IBIS technology used in the NIBIN program, for example, can link one crime to another crime or series of crimes. It can also link a possessor's gun to a crime or series of crimes. Again, it answers the question, what crimes has this gun been used in? The outside data answers the who questions. E-Trace, ATFC Trace, for example, can trace a firearm to the first retail purchaser, and sometimes it's just one or two skips across the pond to the actual gun uh, in the hands of the person who fired it. DNA, fingerprints, also answer the who question. Who's been associated in the life of this gun? Earlier I mentioned tactical and strategic value, and for example, tactical values, short-term data collected on, very, on a very case-specific or series of cases. For example, NIBIN, it helps you connect a gun to a crime. E-Trace, it helps you connect a person to a gun. Strategic value, on the other hand, is data collected over the long term. And I'll use the example of crime gun trace data collected through E-Trace over an annual period. You can interrogate the data, quantify it by gun type, possessors, sources, location. This, this strategic value helps you understand the true nature of your gun crime problem. In fact, I would say that if you don't have a, a policy to trace all the guns taken into police custody pursuant to investigations, you never really know what your crime gun problem is. Otherwise, you're just speaking from opinion and innuendo. Crime gun trace data collected over a period of time gives you the ability to identify patterns and trends, help you formulate policies, and help you direct a response. The key here, though, is if you are going to use crime gun trace data for strategic purposes, 
you really must be tracing every gun and not just some of your guns. You, if you only trace some, you risk skewing your, your data and you could actually come up with the wrong answer. Here's a case that brings together both the inside and the outside information, the ballistics and the crime gun trace data. It's an actual case. A woman driving in Minnesota stops at a stop sign. A man jumps out and tries to carjack her. She tries to flee, but she's shot four times. Second driver encounters the scene, stops to help, and the man carjacks her van. That van was later used in an armored car robbery and torched in the next state over in Wisconsin. Five years later, police in Minnesota arrested a felon for unlawful possession of a firearm. It had an obliterated serial number. But using Nibin, the crime lab linked the firearm to that cold case shooting and carjacking I just mentioned. However, the felon that possessed that gun was quickly eliminated as the suspect. There was no way he could have done the carjacking and the shooting in question. Now we just used the data from inside the gun to learn what crimes the gun's been involved in. But now we want to know who's been involved in this gun's life. So we need to turn to the outside of the gun information. The Minnesota Crime Lab restored the obliterated serial number. ATF was able to trace it to the first retail purchaser. Probable cause was discovered to view the purchaser as a suspect. A search warrant was executed at his residence in Wisconsin, and evidence linking him to all of the prior crimes was found there. The suspect was convicted, imprisoned, and is now appealing his conviction, trying to overturn his confession. The data from outside the gun helped tell us the whole story. Now all of this takes policy to run, to make happen. And whether it be big P policy or little p policy, it always takes policy. An example of big P policy is what's happened recently in New York. A two-year-old law was passed requiring all law enforcement agencies in New Jersey to perform an NCIC check, an E-trace, and a NIBIN process on every gun taken into custody by law enforcement in New Jersey. The Attorney General and the New Jersey State Police Colonel were tagged with implementing the law and establishing prior protocols to do so. Before the new policy took place, just a NIBIN check alone took an average of six to ten months to complete. Timeliness is key. I was able to assist a, a cross-jurisdictional team involving law enforcers, forensic experts, and prosecutors at the federal, state, and local levels in New Jersey to help them map their processes, identify choke points, eliminate those choke points, and they came up with a program called RAIN, Rapid Assessment into NIBIN, a process designed to speed uh, the use of NIBIN. This process was communicated across the entire state to law enforcers and prosecutors. However, one lesson was learned very quickly, and that you got to be able to manage the inside plus the outside information to get the whole story. And just focusing on rain alone, the Niven part of this, the inside part of this, quickly put ourselves in the position where a gun that came from a seemingly insignificant incident, like shooting at a stop sign, once run in Niven, then linked itself to a murder and became a murder weapon. Without giving thought to collecting the outside information, the DNA, the fingerprints, etc., we could have crossed over some bridges we could not have gone back across to get at a later date. 
So what New Jersey did was incorporate a complete inside and outside processing protocol to get the whole story right up front soon after the gun was taken into custody. Today, New Jersey does all this in 24 hours. They intake the gun, safety check it, preserve it, it goes right to a CSI. The CSI walks it down the hall, it's given a visual trace, uh, excuse me, a visual examination for biomaterials and trace evidence. It's processed for latent fingerprints. It's swabbed for DNA. If the serial number has been defaced, it takes time out for some photographs. Otherwise, it goes right to ballistics. It's walked down the other end of the hallway. It's run through Nibin. Once it's into Nibin, um, the serial number, had it been defaced, is restored. The Nibin hit or potential lead is given within 24 to 48 hours. It's given through a centralized email distribution list. Everybody that needs to know and wants to know is already on that list. There's no decision on who to share this information with. All you do is link the doc document to the email and push send. It also goes to the Regional Crime Gun Intelligence Center where the data is entered um, into a software system for analysis and further analysis and distribution. The New Jersey State Police has seen a 78% increase in Nibin leads and they're generated 300% faster than in the past. The key to this was timeliness and sustainability. And just like a three-legged stool, it requires that your people, your processes, and your technology are all in balance. If you have the process leg of the stool is too long, you have too many processes, not enough people, the stool falls over. The people leg's too short, the stool falls over. Technology can help balance your people and your processes. It can make your people more efficient and effective, and it can make your processes more timely and certainly more sustainable. Some key considerations. Assemble the right mix of stakeholders to think and act together. I'm talking about policymakers and administrators. They need to make gun crime a priority. There's a lot of handshakes, agreements that need to take place because of so many different people involved in the process. And again, because so many are involved in the process, there are a lot of handoffs of information going back and forth that have to take place. We need a common ship. To, we need to develop and share a common vision. Hopefully that vision is to enforce the laws on the books in order to bring justice for victims, resolution for their loved ones, and peace for their neighborhoods. One thing that I've seen that works pretty well is to assemble a leadership team of strategic uh, uh, value for in, involving policymakers, people that can make things happen, senior man management level type people, people that can call a meeting amongst different organizations, send people to the meeting, open doors, provide resources, those types of folks. It has to be a multi-layer law enforcement mix of enforcers, forensic experts, and prosecutors. Policies need to emanate from this group. These are the policy makers. Policies drive, adhered to policies sustain. At this point, I would also say that it helps to identify any must-have regional partners, because criminals move and evidence of their crimes get scattered across jurisdictions. So it, it helps to determine what your cross-jurisdictional crime patterns are, especially involving gun crime, as it will require an interagency uh, collaboration to, uh, uh, to address. One question to ask yourself is, how likely is it that the gun in your murder case is hiding in the evidence vault of a neighboring police department? 
another key consideration is uh, I would review the IACP resolution on crime gun protocols. It sets out a great policy. It's short, easy to read. Um, it has six tenets. And really they cover everything from A to Z on developing a crime gun investigation protocol. When it comes to the information inside and outside the gun, sometimes it's easy to make a decision. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to trace this gun. Uh, maybe I'll knife in it, but I'm not going to do fingerprints because sometimes we don't have good luck finding fingerprints. But every time you make a trade-off, you have to understand that it can weaken your investigative capacity. So that's why it's so important that the critical law enforcement mix of police prosecutors and forensic personnel make these decisions. You need a second team to, to work with the leadership team and that's an operational team consisting of first and uh, second line uh, uh, people. The law enforcement mix again is relevant. They, this team needs to be made up of police, forensic and prosecuting organizations. This is the team that will map and identify any choke points, remap them for sustainable improvements, draft the protocols, and send it back up to the leadership team to get buy-in, to get the required policy drivers to drive them, and any resources that are also needed. Additional considerations are be cognizant of bridging the gaps. Consider time and distance obstacles for lab transfer from the police department that takes the gun into custody to the lab that's going to perform the forensic analysis. The longer the distance, the crit more critical the time becomes and the greater obstacle timeliness encounters. Learn what's working elsewhere, just as needed. There's a lot of best practices out there. Um, don't be ashamed to uh, adopt someone else's and modify it and make it yours. Report timely to the right people. De develop an efficient, effective method of analysis and results reporting. Crime gun centers are one. You'll hear much more about that as we go along today. And that New Jersey listserv email list I talked about I think is one of the best ways I've seen so far to get the word out to the people that need it. Crime gun processing protocols again developed by the team, the law enforcement mix. Think about NIBIN as an investigative tool as well as a forensic one. It can provide crucial timely investigative leads as well as evidence for court. The goal should be for these all of these examinations 48 hours. Build for sustainability and timeliness. Ensure balance of people, processes, and technology. And consider even the seemingly insignificant shootings, stop sign shootings we call them. So what's the end game here? Well, exploit the data that each crime guns hold, generate crime gun intelligence of tactical and strategic value, conduct consistent and methodical investigations of gun-related crimes, identify and stop armed criminals before they can do more harm, effectively enforce the laws on the books in order to afford justice for the victims, resolution for their loved ones, and peace for their neighbors. So thanks for the privilege of your time and attention. I'm now going to transition to where the rubber meets the road, the Denver approach. And Jeff will tell you uh, what it's like out there uh, in, in, re in the real world. You got it, Jeff. Thank you, Pete. Hello, everyone. Thanks, thanks for uh, having me. I'm going to talk a little bit today um, about the uh, ATF Crime Gun Intelligence Centers that are uh, a, a very important program, not only to ATF, but DOJ and uh, all our partners. 
and uh, there are a lot of great things happening in the uh, country today um, uh, surrounding crime gun intelligence centers and their preventative uh, aspect. Next slide. So before we start, <clears throat> and this is um, going to uh, reiterate uh, things that we talked about in the first webinar and some of the things that uh, uh, Pete so eloquently uh, spoke of uh, today. So where, where do you start when you start this program? And I will tell you, start small and let the results drive your, your growth. Um, in, in a day where, boy, no one has any resources, um, resources aren't coming for any of our agencies. Uh, we have what we have, uh, and we have to deal with it. So um, start small in your, your crime gun intelligence center concept and uh, let the results drive growth of personnel and uh, the entire program. As Pete touched on, boy, all shootings matter. Not just the shootings where uh, a murder occurred, not just the high profile shootings uh, that make the news, all shootings matter. And uh, the, the more we get into this and the more data we capture, uh, we're definitely um, <clears throat> seeing a couple of things. One, these guys are, our bad guys are bad shots, and, and thank goodness they are. <clears throat> um, when we really look at the data and the number of shots fired and shooting events across the country, but really murder is a very rare occurrence. We, you have to treat all shootings as they matter, which means you have to collect the shell casings from all shootings, whether someone is hit or not, whether there's witnesses or not as well. The other thing, please keep in mind the only difference between an unlawful discharge and a murder is an inch. And we see that over and over, not only in Denver, but Seattle, Milwaukee, Phoenix, uh, Tucson, Memphis, all places where uh, that have viable crime gun intelligence centers and are partnering with ATF and NIBIN and tracing. <clears throat> we are seeing over and over the intent in 99% of the shootings of murder is absolutely there. They just miss. And lastly, all casings and crime guns that are recovered by your agencies need to be entered into NIBIN and traced. Not just the murders, not just the high profile shootings, not just the, the shootings where someone is actually shot, but every single shooting event, every single crime gun, whether it's uh, confiscated on a, a DUI traffic stop or confiscated from someone uh, who's arrested on a misdemeanor warrant. Every crime gun, every casing needs to be traced and entered into NIBIN. Next uh, slide, please. So there's a lot of questions about, you know, what really is a crime gun intelligence center. <clears throat> uh, I, I will tell you. ATF Crime Gun Intelligence Centers, uh, to not only the ATF but our partners, they are not cold case squads. Absolutely not. Th make no mistake about this. This is a preventative strategy meant to disrupt uh, serial shooters that are on your streets terrorizing your neighborhoods right now uh, with comprehensive collection entry in the NIBIN and the timely turnaround by the crime labs back to the investigators uh, means that your shooters are on the streets. There is nothing cold case about ATF CJIX. <clears throat> really think about uh, dedicating a group of investigators and partnering with your ATF counterparts uh, in, in your different cities about creating a dedicated investigative team that can actually go out and, and investigate the NIBIN hits. Uh, these, these NIBIN hits 
are absolutely complex. Uh, each NIBIN investigation will involve uh, most likely <clears throat> uh, multiple quarters of search warrants for cell phone, um, Facebook search warrants to go get items of clothing, court orders to match DNA. Um, they're very complex cases and therefore uh, a, a dedicated uh, a team of investigators to actually go out and ensure that uh, those NIBIN hits are followed up on is imperative. Urgency. You have to work with urgency. That's one of the most valuable lessons we have learned um, as an agency in, in our respective cities that, that we partner with. It's all about urgency. It's about taking care of that shooter right now. Not next year, not two years from now, but right now. What we've also learned is shooters, they do not stop. It's, it's just a small portion of the population, again, the, 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 the most crime. And uh, shooters are no different. Hence the term serial shooters. They will not stop until law enforcement disrupts them. The other thing that NIBIN tracing, good reports, good interviews, when you put it all together, it actually shows us uh, not only who we have to go out and arrest, but actually how they are prosecuted. From a state perspective side, um, uh, if you're a DA, <coughs> excuse me, it will show you how, how much of a bond needs to be set. It will tell the DA what charges to bring. It will also tell the DA, probably the most important thing, is who they should plea bargain with and who they should not or how they should plea bargain with, with defendants as well. Federally, it tells us the same thing. It tells the U.S. attorneys the same thing. It tells the U.S. attorney who we can wait to indict or who we need to write a federal arrest warrant, uh, warrant for right now and get off the streets. It tells the U.S. attorney what charges to bring. And most importantly, it tells the U.S. attorney um, uh, and DAs how they can use that information in a sentencing hearing to maximize prison sentences. Next slide, slide please. So when you start your program and it's timely and comprehensive NIBIN, you're going to get a whole bunch of NIBIN hits back. And that's a good thing. One of the things that is most often um, very difficult for people is the idea of how do you cope with your high volume. And I will tell you right now, you're going to have to cope with your, your, your numerous NIBIN hits through a triage process. And that process, um, as you're looking at the, the different shooting events linked uh, by NIBIN, <clears throat> such factors as solvability, seriousness of the crimes, named suspects, are there victims present? Are there witnesses present? Is there anything investigatively that we could gain traction on to go out and make a difference now? And that will all be a part of your triage on deciding what hits your dedicated team will investigate or not. <clears throat> Trace all crime guns that are entered into NIVIN. Uh, some, some bigger uh, cities in the country, it's very difficult for them to trace every single firearm that they recover and take into their custody. At the very least, marry NIBIN with tracing. So every single crime gun that's test fired and entered into NIBIN, ensure with your ATF counterpoints uh, parts that they are being uh, traced as well. As Pete said, develop sound operational uh, SOPs. How are you going to operate Formalize that in a written document or in an MOU and make sure that the operation process, your process on how you triage, disseminate leads, how you investigate, how you get information back 
uh, to command staff is all memorialized and set forth so it is um, a, a, a streamlined process that does not change. Quality over quantity, can't stress this enough. Again, it gets back to the uh, lack of resource. It's very hard to walk into chief's office um, and, and say, hey, this sounds like a good program. We, sh we should dedicate resources towards this. We have to prove that this works. And, and part of that is not only starting small and letting results grow, but it's also ensuring that it's quality over quantity. That is the only way to grow the, uh, this program internally. I can tell you Denver PD, when we started this um, process in, in, in Denver, um, we, uh, Denver PD only had one TFO, task force officer assigned to ATF. As it, sound, as it stands today, there are four TFOs assigned to ATF plus a sergeant. Conversely, uh, we, we were much the same way. When, when we started, we had two agents uh, in, investigating. And now, uh, in Denver, we're up to five. So it lets the results drive forward. Um, and it, it, results will, will drive growth and provide the command staff with the evidence on why this program should expand. Next slide, please. So this is an example of uh, the, the, the Denver Crime Gun Intelligence SOP. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, very, very top of the slide, working all the way down. Crime gun is entered into Niven. It is traced. Our agents will, uh, and, and task force officers will, will uh, consult with the assigned detectives. We will read all the associated reports and related crime data. We will go out and re-interview shooting victims and witnesses. We will interview associates. We will go, uh, if, if the crime gun is in fact recovered, we will go interview the uh, gun store who sold it, if it is local, to try to glean any other information. We will uh, interview the original purchaser. We will even interview the, the possessor as well. Next slide, please. This is our uh, this is the Denver uh, Crime Gun Intelligence uh, Center SOP for shell casings. Very similar um, to the uh, pistol. Uh, again, all associated reports are compiled and reviewed. Goes through our triage uh, uh, system. If it is uh, a case that we choose uh, that deems um, appropriate or warrants further investigation, uh, we will go ahead. Our team will cons again consult with the assigned detectives. We will look and um, look at the victim as well. Uh, victim profiles: Is the victim a, a gang member? Does the victim have a criminal history? Where does the victim live? Uh, things like that. We will go and, and again interview the, the victim interview witnesses. And lastly, um, when we are um, successful, we will direct investigative enforcement operations towards that uh, person that we I identify as a, as a shooter. Now, I will tell you on a, on a side note, when we first uh, started this program in Denver, uh, I thought it was going to be very easy. I thought uh, it would be you get a gun, you, 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 you get a gang member with a gun or a criminal with a gun. It, it hits into Niven, and boom, you show a photo lineup, and off you go. And like many things, I was completely wrong on that. I will tell you that the vast majority of our cases in Denver, and from talking to uh, other CJICs across the country, uh, actually, believe it or not, most of the uh, in most of the successful cases that are prosecuted and and the uh, serial shooters are put into prison the firearm is never recovered. So please keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Uh, 
<clears throat> so what does it mean? When, when Niven links several shooting events, every, every different event, every report holds a piece of that puzzle. One report may have a specific uh, suspect vehicle uh, description. The second report may actually have a, uh, a specific physical description of the shooter. Third report may have the identity, identity of the gang that is responsible for the shooting. So in and of itself, these things may not they don't really mean much, but when you put them together, it starts really focusing in on where you need to be. For example, an eight-tray gangster crip gang member who drives a specific vehicle, who has a specific physical description. When you think about that and start being able to search your uh, your own records management system, your your existing gang databases. Uh, boy, you are really able to start narrowing down on one specific person. Tracing. I'm a big believer that crime gun tracing has to integrate with NIBIN. It will again focus your resources on the few people or gun stores that are actually responsible for putting the crime guns out on in the European communities that are responsible for shootings. Very powerful, very powerful information. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the triage that we put out. Again, we work with urgency. We don't, there is no time to put out a 50-page intelligence um, uh, product to then put to the investigators. Time is of the essence. It's urgency. We've put everything in the uh, NIBIN with urgency. We've traced with urgency. When we get results back, we have to act with urgency. So uh, this is an example of a, a Denver crime gun intelligence uh, triage. Uh, this gives you a map. This is a one-page referral that we use. This is the top of the page. As you, as you can see, it gives you the geographical locations of the shooting, which is very important. Uh, there's a lot you can glean about uh, when you look at where the shootings occurred, when they occur, who is involved, case numbers. Uh, uh, the dates between are very important uh, as well. Next slide. This is the bottom of the page. Again, this is just a one-page uh, document. Uh, on the left, you have such information as uh, the offense, what the evidence actually was, show casings or recovered firearm, uh, was an aggravated assault, attempt murder, uh, unlawful discharge, uh, shooting into an occupied structure, gives the date, location, the name of the assigned detective, and then moving over to the right, our, our intelligence product also gives any suspect uh, description or street names if known. Again, very important, it gives us the names of the victims and witnesses. It gives the address, again, very important when you talk in, the, in terms of uh, gang shootings, any vehicle descriptions, and a short synopsis of the case. This is a one-page document that's created with urgency and immediately given to the investigators of our dedicated investigative team that can take a good first blush at this, get a great idea of where they need to go and how they need to get there. Next slide, please. So just uh, how this all comes together, there's, a, there's a, a, a man in Denver named Anthony Dennis. So uh, Anthony actually uh, committed a burglary, and on the first burglary, uh, as he was walking away, he turned around and shot and killed 
the homeowner's uh, labradoodle dog. No reason. Dog was um, not an attack dog, not a watch dog, very friendly. Um, second shooting, uh, the homeowner interrupted the daytime burglary. As Anthony Dennis calmly walked away from the house, the owner said that she was going to call the police. He turned around and fired multiple shots at her, narrowly missing, uh, um, narrowly missing the homeowner. The third shooting is uh, uh, reported as a shot's fired, and it, uh, it turned out that uh, Anthony shot in an unarmed uh, rival gang member. But by the time the officers showed up, everyone was gone. No, no witnesses, no victims, um, nothing. Uh, the officers did collect, obviously, did collect the show casings. No, uh, noted which house they were found in front of. Not only was Anthony committing uh, burglaries, but in these burglaries, he was actually stealing women's underwear. And all these events occurred within days of, of each other. So obviously it became uh, very apparent through our, our triage process that uh, this is an individual that had to be disrupted before he would, uh, or he was going to murder somebody for sure. Next slide. This is the, the first shooting where the M is, is uh, the back alley where he turned and, and fired multiple shots and killed the dog. On the next slide. You'll see this is where he uh, calmly walked away from the house as the owner, uh, homeowner was yelling at him. He turned and fired multiple shots at the homeowner. And on the next slide, you will see uh, this is where the shooting uh, occurred where Anthony shot at a rival gang member. And please keep in mind, this third shooting, when by the time the officers got there, there was no victims, witnesses, everybody had, had run away. Next slide. So why is that important? Well, obviously, the first two uh, incidents, uh, Denver PD just did an outstanding job of investigating. Uh, they collected uh, uh, some DNA. Uh, it did not match to anybody in, in a CODIS database. Um, they had just done a, a extremely thorough investigations. So we actually go out, our dedicated team goes out, and they go to the third shooting. And on the, on the third shooting, as they're doing a house canvas, the very first house that they knock at, the homeowner says, hey, you must be here about the shooting. Do you want the license plate number? Our, our detective said, absolutely. What is this license plate number? Witness said, hey, this is that uh, car that uh, was involved in the shooting. He was the one getting shot at. They immediately go to the house um, of the registered owner, find the car. The car is absolutely riddled with bullets. They contact the registered owner who, who identifies Anthony Davis as the suspect. Um, the shooting was over the fact that uh, our, our victim was a crip. Anthony Davis is blood. Our, our crip victim was actually visiting someone. Anthony Davis recognized him and uh, shot at him for being in the wrong neighborhood. Very significant because now that, that last shooting where there was no, no information at all, that appeared there was no information at all, actually is the case that solved it. And that was linked by Nibin. Without Nibin, there is no doubt that we would have never got to Anthony Dennis in time and he would have actually killed somebody. We were able to uh, immediately go out and arrest Anthony Dave, uh, Dennis, get him into custody, uh, do some court orders for uh, search warrants, all that good stuff. And uh, he just received a very lengthy prison sentence uh, in the state of Colorado. Next slide, please. And that is it. I thank you for your time. Uh, please feel free to contact me, and, and I'll speak for Pete on this, or, or, or Pete as well. Uh, we are definitely here to help. We get very passionate about this, very excited, and uh, we will help in, in any way we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, at this point, we're going to open it up for, oh, sorry, Pete, do you have more? Oh, it's all to you. 
<laughs> great, great. I saw the slide transition. At this point, we'll open it up for questions. The first question we received is directed toward Jeff, and that is, and, and Pete, feel free to weigh in as well. How long did it take to write and pass the policy in Denver and or New Jersey to make E-Trace and NIBIN entry compulsory? Well, in, in, in Colorado, it is not a state law. But when we started this program in Denver, uh, and again, we, we started very small. We actually started with about three people is all. And right now, it's up to 25. And that has actually been driven by the, by the results. So to answer your question, it was a matter of, of, of proving the preventative qualities of this program. Um, and, and, and as we, as we grew, we developed the SOPs. We took out what was not working. We added uh, different things. We were always going back and critically looking at what we were doing, how we could improve, how, how could we could get faster. Um, and, and with that said, we will share, I will share everything that we have with you. There's no, no use to uh, uh, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. You know, I, I say this, I made a lot of mistakes. And, uh, but I, I've learned from the mistakes that I made. Uh, I was surrounded, lucky enough to be surrounded by just tremendously talented people who are passionate. Um, so from, from start to finish, and we're certainly not finished where we want to be in Denver, but, but I will tell you um, that it was probably about a year, uh, about a year, year or so where it actually started to become ingrained in, um, ATF and, and the Denver PD culture that everything had to be nibbed and, and, and every crime gun traced. In fact, uh, you'd be surprised at the number of times where the chief will call, um, the, the Denver chief will call the unit and the, the two first questions he always asks, hey, that shooting last night, were there nibbed leads? And if there was a gun, was it, was it traced? And I think right when the chief started to ask us those questions, we, we all felt very good because we knew it was becoming institutionalized as a part of the everyday SOP. Pete? Yeah, actually, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I'm glad it was asked because it's something that really goes to the heart of the matter here today that drives everything. And like earlier, I mentioned that there's big P policy and small P policy. What they did in New Jersey with a law passed by legislatures was big P policy. But every police chief in this country could put small P policy in place tomorrow to task their, their, their staff to come up with such a, a, a protocol and implement it within their department. When you're bringing in other departments around the region and other organizations, prosecutor organizations, forensic organizations. It takes a little longer to do the, the uh, written agreements. But getting back to the question on New Jersey, the interesting thing about that is in 2008, the Attorney General in New Jersey issued the same directive, essentially, requiring the three protocols, NCIC, E-Trace, and NIBIN, to be done by law enforcement agencies. Five years later, 2013, the legislature feels obligated to take what the Attorney General put in place as a directive and, and make it the law. Why? Because it hadn't, it hadn't become institutionalized like Jeff met, uh, mentions. And that's the key. Crime gun processing protocols that work for the region in which they will be implemented, designed by the law enforcers, the prosecutors, and the forensic service providers, all in agreement. Those things will sustain over time. Those are the things that need to be driven by policy. It could be big P policy that takes a while, or it could be small P policy that can move very quickly and be instituted essentially tomorrow. Once the New Jersey State Police were tasked with developing the protocol to implement the law, 
the actual mapping of the processes and, and getting it down on paper and designing the RAIN program, for example, was, was done in a matter of weeks. What takes a long time, and again, Jeff hit the nail on the head, is to institutionalize it so that uh, a, a crime gun trace or a Nibin, a Nibin search becomes as ingrained as a, uh, a, a motor vehicle check on a license plate that's been called into the dispatcher. Great, thank you. And the next question we have is again for both of you, and that is, do you ever get DNA off cartridges loaded into a magazine? Jeff, you want me to take it? Oh, uh, sure. You can start, Pete. Yeah, there's been some experiments with that, and and I've I've heard I've heard all all kinds of things ab about that. I've heard pros and cons, yeses and nos. Um, I I think the jury's still out, depending on who we talk to. Um, I know this that since we're talking about DNA. They do get a lot of DNA, workable DNA, off the guns themselves, swabbing in different areas, and there's protocols to do that. Um, one important thing to mention about DNA, as, as both Jeff and I have uh, referred to it in our presentation, is that I'm not suggesting anyway that every DNA swab be sent out for, uh, for typing. Uh, that's, it's expensive, it's time consuming. But I am suggesting that every gun go through the protocol to be swabbed for DNA it can be done very cheaply with a homemade kit and that DNA preserved in the file. So when Nibin links that gun to a murder, for example, we're not scrambling around wishing that, oh my God, I wish we went back and got DNA three weeks ago uh, and now a million people have handled it. It's gone through ballistic testing and every other handling in the world. So. Again, these decisions, though, need to be made by the law enforcement mix, the law enforcers, the prosecutors, and the forensic people sitting down, thinking and acting together to come up with a protocol that works best for them in their region. Yeah, I, I, uh, I echo what, what Pete just uh, said. And I, I think uh, the the bottom line question is, is there usable DNA collected off the fire sh uh, shell casings? And in, boy, the, the vast, vast majority of the time, um, it is not. And um, I know from the, the, the Denver Crime Lab director is named Gregory, uh, Gregory, Gregory LeBurge, excuse me, and Greg is absolutely fantastic. He's actually an expert in DNA. Um, done a lot of studies on, on DNA, and I just don't think the we're quite there yet on fired shell casings because it's actually touched DNA. But I do believe within probably the uh, next five to ten years, we will be there. And, and I envision actually at that point um, probably having uh, the, the street officers that go and collect shell casings actually providing them with the uh, with kits very similar to the uh, Nix drug kits, where they can actually collect and swab shell casings um, and do it all at the front end collection, as opposed to uh, leaving it to the lab to do. Which and Pete's right, it's it's very time consuming, which could actually kill your program. Um, so a lot of interesting. I'm sure we could talk on and on about the, the DNA uh, uh, question, uh, but. Uh, in short, no, we just don't see a lot of it in Denver from fire chill casings. Great, thank you so much, both Pete and Jeff. This next question um, occurred when, Jeff, you were presenting, so I'll pose it to you. And that is, between your four TFOs and your five ATF agents, what percentage of NIBIN leads are you able to follow up on? And that is an excellent question. So I will tell you, Right now, uh, the, the unit, uh, and, and there is some PSN grant money that we used as overtime to get other detectives to work NIBIN cases on, on overtime. So uh, 
the, the unit itself was hovering at between 20 and 25 percent of the total number of NIBIN hits that were able to actually investigate as a dedicated uh, team. Um, in large part due to uh, the, the, the PSN grant and the uh, addition of uh, additional um, investigators were actually closing in at about 40 percent. And by the last count, and this, this, will, this was just amazing to me, we went back and looked at our rate of success, so to speak, and in 83% of the cases, total number of cases that we investigated as a team, we were able to identify a shooter 80 or in 83% of the time, which was just a, amazing to me. And, and I think it goes back to uh, some of the things that Pete said earlier about putting the whole piece together, inside, outside reports, NIB and tracing, everything comes together to give you that complete picture. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're probably closing in on 40%. Great, thank you. And this next question, it occurred again, Jeff, when you were presenting, but I believe both of you can expand on it. And that is, was the crime analysis and intelligence software developed in-house, or was a company approached to develop the software, for, software specifically for each state? Well, I, I can tell you in, in, in Denver, um, we actually developed our own internal processes using uh, what we had available to us. Um, one of the, one of the uh, things, there, there are some uh, companies out right now that are doing some uh, pretty uh, neat things around NIBIN. And, uh, and one of those is a, a company called Gun Ops. Um, but as far as using specific programs, we used only what was available to us. And um, so a lot of that, you know, when we do the triage, unfortunately, uh, you know, we don't have that, uh, th those tools to, to actually put into a system and have them spit uh, data back at us. So, the review process for us starts with uh, several people re actually reading the reports and, and going from there. Yeah, I, I would echo what, what Jeff said that th there's, um, there's a number of off-the-shelf uh, tools out there that, that can be used. GunOps is one. Um, if you go on the internet and uh, query GunOps, GunOps will offer a, um, a very generous free trial period uh, for, for their, their product. Uh, but there's other ones too. There's uh, Forensic Logic. There's a, a product from a company called Winyard. Um, there, there's, uh, there's about three or four of them out there. What's the most important is um, when you start to bog down, the good news is when you start doing these protocols, you will be getting an enormous amount of, of good crime gun intelligence. And the bad news is when you start doing these protocols, you will be getting an enormous amount of crime gun intelligence. So you, you, you're going to have to find a way to balance your people and your processes, and that's the third leg of the stool, technology. And you can that's really the most important decision to make, to turn to technology to help you sustain your people and processes. And, and there's several out there. Um, try them out. Uh, see which one works for you. Um, it can only help. Great. Thank you so much. And we are at the top of the hour, but we do have time for just a couple more questions, if that's okay with our instructors. The first question we have um, is, in law enforcement departments, who generally has the primary responsibility for making the entries into NIBIN? Is it crime scene unit or the property unit? Can you expand on this? Yeah, I'll, Jeff, you I'll, want, if you don't you mind, go I'll first. Start. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you, you know, it, it varies from uh, de department to department, site, NIBIN site, NIBIN site. Um, I, I think Pete when Pete says what works for you, that's exactly true. And, and what works for us in, in Denver 
Um, Denver is unique in that it has uh, the, the crime lab has immediate access to the evidence. The crime lab is literally 100 feet from where all the evidence is. Huge advantage. So in, in Denver, it's actually um, the farms examiners that do the entries along with ATF personnel. We cross-trained ATF personnel. Um, I know in, in some other sites, it's actually police officers or detectives that do the entry. In, in others, it's, um, it's uh, evidence people, folks that are trained that are actually doing the uh, evidence entry. So um, again, I, I still from Pete, I think it, it's whatever works best for you. The main thing is thinks outside of the box. Everything that you, you do, you have to think outside of the box. Be innovative in your thinking in terms of, of, of making it timely. Pete? Yeah, the, the um, Niven uses the latest uh, um, IBIS uh, Brass Tracks HD 3D technology and it's, it's highly, um, highly automated. Look, just about anyone who knows how to use a Windows and use a mouse can enter data into the system with a, 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 short, a short couple of days of training. Um, so then it comes down to what, what is the right mix? What, what is the best way to use your resources? In, in, in Denver, they have firearms examiners entering, and that works for them. In other places, firearms examiners could be um, a, a rare commodity, um, so that you want to maximize their time actually confirming hits under a microscope and giving opinions in court. Um, you might not want to use their precious time uh, to enter the data, whereas you could use a technician or, or a police officer um, to do the same thing. Sometimes, uh, depending on location, the ability to put a, a brass track system out uh, at a remote location uh, feeding into a laboratory um, and operated by a, a, a technician, a, a trained individual, could uh, really force multiply your resources. So again, I'm going to echo what Jeff says. It's really what works because the answer is all of the above can, uh, can, can participate and add value uh, to the process. Great. Thank you so much, Pete and Jeff. With that said, this concludes our webinar for the day. Pete and Jeff, I just want to ask you before we sign off, are there any closing remarks that you'd like to share with our audience? Um, it's Pete. I'll, I'll say one thing that, you know, if there's a most important thing that we've talked about today, I, I'm going to say the most important uh, thing is innovation, the, the will to innovate in every sense of the word, word to, to, to do the things that you've been doing, uh, to do them in different ways, better ways, uh, more efficient, effective, more timely. Um, it's really the willingness to do that because if you don't have the willingness to change the way you do business, then we'll never get to the big P or small P processes. And I'll turn it over to Jeff. Yeah, very well said, Pete. Um, I, I just just to build upon uh, Pete. I think the the last thing I would like to say is make no mistake about this: the the, the crime gun intelligence that that Pete and I have presented on today is a preventative strategy. It is all set up to identify that serial shooter and that and their sources of crime guns and stop them, disrupt them any way we legally can to prevent that next shooting from happening. And so the takeaway is this is definitely a preventative program. And please feel free to reach out to Pete or I. We are here to help in any way that we can. Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time today and your commitment to making this a successful session. And also to our audience for being um, particularly engaged during this event. Our next webinar to wrap up this series is on Tuesday, June 14th. We encourage you to tell your colleagues about it, and we will be in touch with everybody soon. Thank you again to everybody who attended, and stay safe. Bye-bye.